us this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Apostle Joshua Selman as he blesses us today. A true Apostle Joshua Selman. I truly honor you, sir. Thank you so much, Pastor Remy David and his wife. And then all the executives. I, I have learned the difference between people as friends, brothers, and in their official capacity. And I will never abuse that. I honor every single one of you in that capacity. Let's give them a big, big God bless you. In the name of Jesus. And I want to salute and honor every man of God. Most people here are preachers. We do not do the things that we do because we're necessarily better. It's an election of grace and the mercy of God. My coming here this afternoon is to help by the Spirit to make contributions to our efficiency as ministers of the gospel and then under this umbrella. And I'm hoping that the few minutes that we have to spend together that God will add grace to grace, faith to faith, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ. Pastor Godman, again, I honor you. Thank you so very much. Let's lift our hands and ask the Lord to speak to us within these minutes that we have to share fellowship together. Someone is praying. My heart is opened. Speak to me. Let the words bring perspective to my efficiency as a minister of the gospel. Let PFN go from glory to glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Help us this afternoon, Spirit of the living God. Speak to us. Cause us to understand. And that we make progress in life, destiny, and even in ministry. To you be all the glory. For in Jesus' name we pray. Please, you may be gloriously seated. Again, God bless you. I'll be talking about three things very quickly. This is what the Holy Spirit placed upon my heart as a contribution to all the discussions. I, un I understand that we have been under the influence of various speakers with vast experiences across leadership and ministry. And so this is an addition to the things that we have learned this morning and I'm praying that what we'll be hearing will truly add value to our spiritual understanding in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus so I'll be talking across three areas uh, very very quickly and then hopefully we'll get to pray and I consider this a very great opportunity because I have learned from scripture and by experience that the quality of believers across any territory is a reflection of the kind and the quality of priesthood within that territory also. Are we together? That means when you sample believers in no particular order, uh, in Lagos, it should be able to give you an accurate feedback as to the quality of men and women of God that we have serving his purposes here. And so everyone here represents at least 10, 20, 30, 40 people, a network of churches. So in speaking to one leader, you are literally speaking to thousands of people. And it's a very noble honor. Hallelujah. Um, two scriptures, Acts chapter 4, I mean Colossians chapter 4 and verse 17. Colossians 4 and verse 17, let me quote it quickly for sake of time. It says, say unto Archippus that you take heed to the ministry that thou hast obtained or received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Paul was speaking to his son in the gospel and he says, to say unto Archippus that you take heed. The word take heed there means be attentive, be discerning, be careful, be intentional over the ministry that thou hast received in the Lord. Notice he never said the ministry you receive from the Lord. 
To receive from the Lord means you don't need a relationship. To receive in the Lord means it is a byproduct of an encounter. Are we together? The ministry you have received in the Lord. Ministry is not just received from the Lord. It is received in the Lord. A derivative of your knowing God, your loving him, your pressing into the things of God. Let's consider one more scripture. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Profound scripture. This is a call and a charge to shepherds, those who love Jesus. Acts 20, 28. May I request that we read it in concert together. Ready? One to read. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, uh -huh, and to all the flock which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God. I'd like us to read it one more time. One to go. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God which he had purchased. Hallelujah. Um, Dr. Gwely made a statement that I heard um, and it was very profound and I think I would like to start from there. It matters that we understand God's program. This is the first thing that I need to talk about. And with all due respect, I think one of the major issues that has affected the efficiency of priesthood within this nation, across the African continent, is that for most people, there is no clarity and definition as to God's program. So if you ask a pastor, what are you doing exactly? He can say, God said, go and raise me a people. And while that may be true, uh, it is not concise enough to produce efficiency. The average pastor is at a loss as to God's program. Most men and women of God, with all due respect, cannot give you an intelligent presentation of God's program, which is the basis for ministry. Are we together? And once that centrality of God's program does not govern your church activity, does not govern your sermons, does not govern your conferences, it is natural to veer off into error and even compromise. Are we together now? It matters that every preacher, every man of God, every intercessor, every general overseer, every superintendent, you must be able to know this for yourself and then raise leaders after this understanding. What exactly is God's program? What is God about across the nations? Are we together now? And I, I, I want to say this, and, and I say this with a burden in my heart, but with every sense of respect. There are certain things that are not left to personal revelation. One of it is God's program. God's program is not just revealed to an individual as a secret. It is a template that is available to everyone who desires to serve him. Are we together now? Yes. Because I think one of the challenges, I will wrap up by identifying a few challenges with the Nigerian church and hopefully proffering a few solutions. And one of it is the abuse of God said. The abuse of I had the Holy Spirit. The abuse of it is brought a lot of chaos, disorderliness. Just because it's a spiritual affair does not mean it cannot be vetted. Are we together now? Yes, yeah, so um, I can come up with anything and because spirituality or the faith work is a relationship between me and God, um, I can say this is what God told me. But then there are standards according to scripture to judge spirits and to test all spirits. Are we learning already? So let me not go ahead of myself. According to scripture and in, uh, theologically we have come to know God's agenda to be called the Great Commission. And while that is very simple enough, most people do not have a very concise picture as to what the Great Commission is all about. If you probe into the understanding of the average pastor, you will find people who tell you the Great Commission is about evangelism. You are right, but it is incomplete. Others talk about transformation. You are right, but you are incomplete. The Great Commission, as we know, um, is holistically revealed across three scriptures. There are three scriptures altogether 
that really form the basis for the Great Commission. I'll just run through them and then I'll list it out for sake of time. Number one is found in Mark chapter 16, please. Mark chapter 16 from verse 15 down to 20. Jesus himself is speaking. This is the first piece of what we know as the Great Commission that represents God's agenda. Everyone in ministry should be about this. This is the construction. This is literally the vision of all that we do being casted from scripture. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach. Preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16, it says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved and he that does not believe shall be damned. So the first part of the Great Commission has to do with the preaching of the gospel. The second part of the Great Commission is found in Mark, Matthew chapter 28 from verse 18. Matthew chapter 28 from verse 18. Same Jesus speaking. This is Matthew's synoptic account. Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All authority in is given unto me in heaven and in the earth. And he says, go ye therefore, verse 19 now, of, yeah, go ye therefore and teach. Now we see that he's going beyond preaching and teach all nations. Mark's account says, preach the gospel to every creature. Now Matthew is saying, teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I don't want to go into the theological debate of this. That's not my assignment now. Are we together now? Verse 20, it says, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And while you are about this business, know that I am with you all the way unto the end of the world. Please say amen. amen. So the first aspect of the Great Commission representing God's agenda has to do with the preaching of the gospel and then the teaching, discipleship. The last aspect is found in Acts chapter 1 from verse 6. Acts chapter 1 verse 6. Jesus is having his final sessions with the disciples so that they would receive the Holy Ghost. And they came to him and said, Lord, will thou at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? The next verse, Jesus replies and says, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Verse 8 now says, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you and that empowerment will cause you to be witnesses. Witnesses. And he defines the geography of the witness. First Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, the entire goal is the uttermost part of the earth. When you combine Mark 16, Matthew 28, and Acts chapter 1, it gives you the whole picture of what we call the Great Commission. Now, the challenge, I came from an evangelical background, and so I understand a bit of the limitations as we have been mentored into understanding the Great Commission. Because on the one hand, we have people who the entire scope of understanding God's agenda is evangelism and that is important but like you will be learning and I think Dr. Ogwele talked a bit about that by the time you bring in the harvest and leave the harvest that way there are consequences even though you gather the harvest are we together now yes and then he talks about teaching and then he talks about being witnesses what is the great commission I wrote here that the Great Commission is a mandate given by Jesus to then his disciples, but today to all believers. A mandate given by Jesus Christ, it was then to his disciples, but now to all believers to reach the entire globe. Please listen. To reach the entire globe with the gospel of salvation, to bring nations to the knowledge of the truth through discipleship and to consequently bring territorial and societal transformation. I will take that again. That the great commission as given by Jesus is a mandate 
to reach the entire globe with the gospel of salvation, to bring nations to the knowledge of the truth through discipleship, and to consequently bring territorial and societal transformation. Immediately you see that there are three aspects to the Great Commission. And every time you deviate from any one of these, you will corrupt the program. Number one, the first aspect of the Great Commission is world evangelization. World evangelization. World evangelization. Reaching the lost. The Bible says that God desires that all men be saved. All men be saved. All men be saved. All men be saved. Men be saved. World evangelization. Statistically, there are about 8.91 billion people upon the earth. 8.1 billion people. I hope my statistics is still right. 8.1 billion people. And there's just a little over 2.6 billion professing Christians. Statistically confirmed across the earth. Now we have a mandate to reach the entire globe. Ladies and gentlemen, it should challenge us that in spite of the churches, the crusades, the conventions, the programs, the advantage of internet, intellectual um, privileges that we have, we have not been able to cover even 30% or 20 or 40% of it. And yet we believe that we're in the end times, we believe that we are wrapping up the church age. Are we together? That means that we have not been doing a very effective job from a statistical standpoint. That if we have about 2.6 billion professing Christians, this includes everything from backsliders to those who just identify with the faith. We are not talking of those who are genuinely saved. Those who have filled a form and wrote there that I am a Christian, even if they are idol worshippers. Are we together? Now, but look at this. Let me challenge you for a moment. How many of you know that our social media applications, um, I'm not sure that most of the applications that we depend helplessly on are even more than 20 to 25 years. Yet somebody brought an idea that broke the barrier of boundary. Somebody brought an idea that broke the barrier of religion. Somebody brought an idea that broke the barrier of education and it's been received by more people upon the earth. Within 20 years, someone sat in his room and formulated an idea that has made the old and young, male and female, Christians and non-Christians, helplessly glued to those applications. It means there is a formula for a more effective world evangelization. Are we together now? If within 20 years... Young people, barely in their 20s, came up with an idea. An idea without the active acknowledgement of the contribution of the Holy Spirit. Are we together? They never came up to say, I open to you that the Holy Spirit, they never attended an impartation service. They never received a prophetic word. And yet they came up with an idea that all of us prophets and apostles, with all the anointing, with all due respect, we are helplessly dependent on those applications. It means there is something God can place upon our lives that will cause the advancement of the gospel to break barriers. The level of inefficiency that we are experiencing in our evangelism should be a concern for anyone who loves Jesus. Are we together? Yes, sir. Number two, the second aspect of the Great Commission is discipleship. Transforming believers through discipleship. Transforming believers through discipleship. It matters what we do with the harvest. Jesus called us fishers of men. And once you fish, you don't drop the fish there like that. You have to walk on it discipleship i can tell you this and i submit to you that the missing ingredient in the kind and the quality of believers that have come out from this nation and africa is largely a product of the poor or no level of discipleship whatsoever the average believer 
is not methodically mentored into understanding God and understanding the ways of God. Acts chapter 20 and verse 32 says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, number one, and then to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. He says, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture, which is able to make you wise unto salvation. The Bible says, an heir for as long as that heir is a child, that he differeth not from a slave, even though he be Lord of all. Are we learning now? Paul said, when I came to you, I couldn't speak of these things because you are still yet as babes and not spiritual. The average believer cannot defend his spiritual understanding. We know a little of everything, a little of prayer here, a little of fasting here, a little of breakthrough, a little of finances. Our growth module is so scattered, it does not produce a people of stature. Nobody attends lecture in any class in the university and receives a degree. The program is constructive. That's why you can predict that this naive student in six years can be a medical doctor because of the quality of the content beyond even the lecturer's ability are we together we must obtain grace from god i'm challenging us in righteousness and with all humility let's stop maintaining members let's raise witnesses the consciousness of maintenance of membership 10 years in church and they cannot defend their spiritual understanding But let me bring the test to us with all due respect. Dear man of God, dear woman of God, dear co-laborer in the gospel. Let me ask you a question. What do you know about prayer? What do you know about Satan? What do you know about Jesus? What do you know about salvation? What do you know about increase? What do you know about leadership? What do you know about the anointing? What do you know about the Holy Spirit? What do you know about warfare? What do you know about growth? What do you know about restoration? What do you know about administration? What do you know about conflict management? These are the bodies of spiritual understanding that makes an individual a leader indeed. You cannot help the people at the same level of understanding with them. Are we together now? Jesus called the people blind, leading the blind. He was not insulting them. He was describing their spiritual state. Pick an average member, five of them, put them on stage and ask them questions. Talk to me about the gospel. You will be surprised. The person is the head of ushering and he does not know what the gospel is. I just know that Jesus died. Okay, how do you lead an unbeliever to become a child of God? Well, you will confess the prayer. What does he say? Because it is not every information about Jesus that saves. There is an exact body of information about Jesus that translates to salvation. He said, let it be known to you, O Israel, that this same Jesus you have crucified has today been exalted as Lord and Christ. And 3,000 people came. Are we learning? We need to go back and probe the basis for our discipleship. Because the truth is, I hate to say this, but many ministers are genuinely called, but they are ill-prepared. It shows in the kinds of sermons that we bring. It shows in the, the centrality. We bring a lot of sermons that are clearly not doctrinal. They are largely opinions or just copying from one person to the other or a transfer from poor mentorship. Are we together? What do you know about prayer? What do you know about fasting? What do you know about oil? What do you know about mantles? What do you know about Satan and demons? With all due respect, and I say this with every humility, sense of humility. If I call any man of God here in no particular order and give you the mic, I say, take five minutes out of my time. Teach us, how do we take over territories? We all want growth. But what is the formula? Because Jesus said the church is built. 
There must be a formula. No architect begins to build without a formula. What is the master plan? We are called master builders. And God wants us to be wise master builders. Another question. Can you tell me the kind of believer you are producing from your teaching every day? If you don't have the picture, something is wrong. A lecturer already has a picture of the kind of student he's producing. From the first day of the lecture, he can assure the people that in five years, an architect is coming out of this lecture. Can you define the kind of believer that our Sunday sermons, our conferences, what kind of believer is in the mind of your spirit? Discipleship. The key to effective discipleship is to understand doctrine. The word doctrine comes from the Latin word doctrina. It means a body of truth that turns a disciple to become like his master. Doctrine. Doctrines are not opinions. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayer that was the apostolic model that was given to them is God helping us every man of God who loves Jesus and loves his program must go back and, 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 and I'm saying this I'm just speaking apostolically to the body of Christ we need to re-examine our spiritual understanding because that is where our sermons come from there are sermons that don't profit the spiritual lives of the people nor build them to become effective witnesses. So here is the progression. Everybody starts as an unbeliever. In iniquity did my mother conceive me. Everybody. Nobody inherits salvation from the womb. Are we together? So the journey is that you start as an unbeliever. Please watch this. And then by acknowledging the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ, translating to eternal life you get to the next level you are a believer and when you become a believer there are three stages there is a babe one who is just saved an infant but void of spiritual understanding the moment you get transformed God introduces you to three ministries to continue the journey to your maturity. Number one is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Number two is the ministry of the word Number three is the ministry of the teaching priest. Anybody who lacks an encounter with these three ministries will have a deformity in his spiritual growth. That is the order. That means the moment an individual gets saved, it's important he understands that there are three ministries about to be introduced to his life and he must embrace all of them. Number one, I repeat, the ministry of of the Holy Spirit. Number two, the ministry of the word, the logos of God, a compendium of the thoughts of God. And then number three, the ministry of a teaching priest, Jeremiah 3.15. And I will give you pastors or shepherds according to my heart and they will feed you with knowledge, they will feed you with understanding. Hallelujah. When this gentleman, whoever he is now, as a babe, encounters these threefold ministries they begin to journey him through the process of transformation what is transformation the name given to the process that makes you become like christ in experience it says my little children of whom i travel until now until christ be formed in you when the believer becomes transformed that is the second layer of the believer the third layer is empowerment a believer can be transformed and yet not empowered. Jesus himself mentored his disciples for three and a half years. They were transformed, but they were not empowered. So he said, tarry ye in Jerusalem. Your issue is not an information deficiency. You do not have power to defend the things that you know. It is dangerous to only be transformed and not be empowered. You will say many things that are correct, but not be able to defend them many things for instance you will be knowledgeable enough to know that god heals but you will never see healing you will be knowledgeable to know that god empowers that god lifts but there is no performance
knowledge that brings transformation and then brings empowerment now please hear me the moment you encounter transformation and empowerment you stop just being a believer you become a witness a witness is a believer who has gone through the school of transformation and gone through the school of empowerment a witness is not somebody who starts ministry you can start ministry and in the spirit you are not yet a witness the trigger for being a witness is that you would have submitted yourself to transformation and submitted yourself to empowerment this is the model that Jesus showed us at age 12 he was at the temple learning the law even though he was the word himself but that did not release him to start ministry the Bible tells us that he met John and he told John, John said, I'm not even worthy to untie the latchet of your shoe. He said, suffer it to be so. It's an ordinance that scripture be fulfilled. And when he baptized John, the heavens opened. And the Bible says, the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the similitude of a dove. And there was a voice that said, this is my beloved son. The question is, what was he before? Amen. So... The challenge most times in Nigeria is that most people are called but they are not yet sent and they go. There is a difference between being called and sent. You are not called to do ministry. You are called to Jesus. Then you are sent to the nations. You are called to Jesus. Your calling is not to a church. Your calling is to Jesus. The Bible says he selected the disciples to be with him and then that he will send them. Something happens when you are with Jesus. It is from the residue of that encounter your sermons come out. It is from the residue of that encounter your impact comes out. Just because you are genuinely called does not mean you have been sent. Jesus called the disciples from day one of his ministry, but he only sent them when he resurrected. The trigger was the coming of the Holy Spirit. So we have a lot of zealous people who start ministry with joy and passion, genuinely called. After one month, they've exhausted everything they know to say. And it is dangerous because when you have exhausted, do you know, Saturday nights are the most frustrating nights for most pastors because they have to think what in the world am I going to share if his righteousness I've preached on it, holiness I've preached on it, breakthrough I've preached on it, giving I've preached on it deliverance of what else do i say if you get into that state it is proof that something has dried in your spirit i'm being very honest with you if you ever get to that state as a man of god go for a retreat fast he says that will show us a path of light it is in your light that we see light that you are so full of light the days are not even enough because there is so much are we together now? The last thing I'll say about discipleship and then I'll pass that quickly. We're still talking on the Great Commission. Do you know when it has to do with knowing the Lord, there is no end to your knowledge. You will keep learning him even in heaven. But when it has to do with building victorious people, the body of truth that turns an ordinary believer to a witness is finite. It's not infinite. The body of knowledge that actually makes the maturity of a believer is finite. Like a curriculum that turns a student to a graduate, you can exhaust it. The student's learning continues, but as far as that, that uh, course of study is concerned, you can exhaust it. Something plus something plus something plus something equals a matured Christian. Building believers to maturity is not an infinite pursuit of knowledge and you are wondering. There is an exact body of knowledge. The Bible calls it marvelous light. The name given to the body that makes stature out of ordinary believers. It is my considered opinion and I hope you don't find offense in it that if any member is faithful in any church for two years under structured mentorship and that person cannot attain unto a state of maturity is either the man of God is wasting his time or the individual is not serious with his growth are we together now praise the name of the Lord it doesn't take forever for the herbalists in our villages to train another person they bring a naive person 
the body of knowledge is exact. They will tell you this young boy will be a herbalist in three years. And you will watch the boy going every day and watching and watching. And after three years, they will now crown him the one who, come, who, who brings mayhem. But how come with all due respect, we have people who have been saved before some children were born. And those children today are pastors and the people are not transformed. Nothing about their communication shows maturity. We need to go back to our pulpits and examine the content. The content is what produces victory or defeat. It matters what the people hear. Thankfully, as a continent and as a nation, we have people who are loyal and passionate to hear. They are so passionate, they don't care what they hear. They trust you enough to hear. And if what you are communicating is error, they are still grateful. One thing the Bible tells us about being a teacher is that you will be judged. For having access to the ears and the minds of people is God speaking to us. So the Great Commission has number one, world evangelization. Number two, discipleship. World evangelization is God's program for the world of sinners. God has a program for the world of sinners. It is called world evangelization. God has a program for the saints. It is called discipleship. Attaining maturity through discipleship. And then the third aspect I'll give you quickly is called territorial transformation. Matthew chapter 5 from verse 13 to 16. Jesus is teaching now and he begins by saying you are the salt of the earth. He says, but if the salt has lost its saltiness or its savour, he says, where shall it be salted? It is good for nothing except to be thrown down and trampled a foot of men. Then he says in verse 14, you are the light of the world. He calls us a city that is set on a hill which cannot be hidden. He says, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but they put it on a candlestick and it gives light to everyone in the room. Verse 16 now says, let your light. The word let means permit. Do not restrain it. Let your light so shine before men that they may see. God wants men to see. That they may see your good deeds and glorify your father. That means the way God gets glory is when the sons manifest good works. John chapter 15 and verse 8. Herein is our Father glorified. When you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. John 15, 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bear much fruit and that your fruit should remain. Territorial transformation. I was very touched as we heard the chairman bringing a lot of societal projects. Can I tell you? Results are evangelists. Results, there are sermons only results can preach. And there is an audience that was designed to hear that sermon. If all we keep doing in church is falling under the anointing and rolling, let me assure you society, we need to bring data driven statistics that shows that the church is relevant. And the way you do that is by becoming light and salt I don't mean to insult you but there are many beer palace near the churches and they join in the praise and worship while the praise and worship is going on they are rejoicing as ah, this drama it looks like they've changed a new drama no transformation within the territory no transformation whatsoever are we together Arm robbers lean on the back of the church while sermons are going, waiting for service to be over so they will steal. No transformation. I don't want to become a part of any movement that does not speak to the development of society. We must be very apostolic in our approach. We must sell God in a way that society will be ready to embrace him. It is the reason why Christianity in many developed nations is being considered as a nuisance because they do not have data-driven proof of relevance of church in nation building. It's good to sing, it's good to shout, it's good to fall and stand, but receive the wisdom that came in the place of prayer and use it to develop the society. 
charitable organizations. By do you know? I I always ask why Jesus fed five thousand. Now I know. The feeding of the 5,000 was number one to prove that he loved them. But number two, as a message to the Roman government, we are not irrelevant and we are not a nuisance. Because by the time you camp 5,000 people for three days and you don't feed them, you have given the government a right to say you want to kill these people, you are a cult and they are right. So Jesus said, don't let them go this way. There's already enmity against this program. Feed them. Let them know that there is an aspect of God's love that speaks to nation building. Do you know, you know women can sing a lot of praises. I'm sure a lot of women sang from the mountain. Where is Caesar? Where is Herod? Come and see what Jesus is doing. You guys have been scribes and Pharisees for years. You never fed us. Can I tell you the truth? unbelievers can also be used to evangelize they will go to a senator and say this borehole came from the church my daughter is in school today caught see the church this marriage that would have scattered was brought back caught see the church i'm an idol worshiper but if you touch that you see that now listen let me tell you this part of the principles of dominion is that you must be able to translate the God life to affect all and sundry because he sends rain both on the good. God has a program for society. Are we together? Every man of God who has attained a commendable size in ministry, you owe, there is a corporate social responsibility. You don't have to be an oil and gas company. Once you are a man of God who intends to last, there must be an expression I used to be in Zaria before I moved to Abuja. And up until now, every time I visit an expression there, once they know I'm around, you will find it's literally like a crusade without calling anybody. You see, one thing I've learned with Muslims, if it's welfare, they won't stop them from coming. They can stop crusades, but once you say food, medicals, with Jesus' joy, even if it's inside the baptistry, they will enter there and wait. Most of us have been wasting an opportunity for a harvest because we are unconcerned about the things that happen in society. That theology is not accurate. We are not of the world, I agree, but we are in the world. We cannot be detached from the activities that happen within our space. I'm praying in the name of Jesus Christ that for a man of God, for a woman of God, for a pastor who has come here, whilst you are hearing me, the Holy Spirit will tell you this is the missing link. This is why your church has been in a place for 10 years and the community, you have never seen the chief of that community. You have never greeted the traditional head within that community. He does know you, yet you have so much property there. The young boys in that community cannot defend the land. They don't the owner they have never participated in anything kingdom you've never called them for anything you will know the relevance of community when there is a crisis I, well with all due respect most of you here in the west you've not really seen a serious crisis you see but when you are in a place where at any point they can burn things here and there there are people who say I am a Muslim but minus this this was the person feeding our wives, our husbands. Church is quiet. This is a pastor's conference. Oh. I want to believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to our hearts. I love us all. It's, it's because that's, that's the way we we'll translate it to improve our people. Are we together? So the Great Commission. I said three things. This is the first thing now. To understand God's program. That God's program, if it must be done well, it must capture within our experience and our mission statements and our church activities, evangelism. Let me submit to you with all due respect. There are churches that cannot remember the last time they made an altar call. And I don't mean to insult us. It is a terrible thing. You cannot finish preaching and consistently and just say, well, if the sermon touched you, you are always free to give your life to Jesus. No, 
that's not the model that was handed over. He desires that all men be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. World evangelization, God's program for the unbelieving world, discipleship that leads to transformation by the sound communication of doctrine, God's program for helping the saints attain maturity and then societal or territorial transformation. God's program for society. You believe that? Say amen. I'm not going to talk much about discipleship. This was the second aspect that I wanted to touch quickly. Um, building men. The Bible says that he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. And that he gave those gifts some apostles some prophets, some pastors, evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. And the Bible says he gave that for the maturing, perfecting of the saints. That the saints will do the work of the ministry. Please look at me. Every man and woman of God here, I want you to know that the business of ministry is the business of building men. The business of ministry beyond physical buildings beyond registering ministries and organizations in corporate affairs commission the ministry that we are called into is the ministry of building men if you are not building men if you build structures more than you build men you are failing if you build structures more than you build men you are failing no matter the ministry expansion, no matter the network of churches globally, the real index is the kind and the quality of men that you are building. Jesus said, I will build my church. He was speaking of these living stones, men. And there is a formula for building men. I'm praying again that God will grant us intelligence to come up with programs that build men. And you know that building men is across various there are the way you build members is different from the way you build leaders are we together now yes the bible says strong meat belongs to them who by reason of use have learned to exercise their senses unto godliness let me tell you the truth there are certain things you should not teach new believers you will destroy them an example prosperity the first sermon a young believer should hear is not prosperity. You teach a young believer a sermon on prosperity, you have destroyed him. He has not learned death to the flesh. He's not learned character. He's not learned how to live a surrendered life. And now you open him up to, you have only multiplied lust upon that person. You will destroy that believer. It is line upon line precept upon precept here a little there a little there must be a formula we must go back and remodel our formula for building believers there are things a believer must hear before he hears about money there are things a believer must hear before he hears about influence every topic is not relevant at every level line upon line jesus being the chief cornerstone show us the ancient path Will you lead us along eternal highway? We want to follow the ways of Jesus. We want to enter your rest. Show us the ancient path. Will you lead us along eternal highway? We want to follow the footsteps of Jesus. We want to let me tell you something God revealed to me. No amount of publicity will bring people more than God himself recommending them to a house he knows they will be trained. Thank God for billboards. Thank God for Facebook. But there is a mystery that no technology can reproduce as far as bringing men. And the Lord added daily. Daily. If you are not willing to save sinners, it is a useless prayer to pray for increase to your church. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. If you are not willing to pay the price, let me tell you the truth. By God's grace, 
I respect everyone here, but I'm not sure there's anyone here who is up to 100 years. Men of God, this call is a call to sacrifice. Let's not allow this geo mentality deceive us. Thank God for honor, but please, let's drop it aside and serve God's people sincerely. A man of God who is a lazy person should retire from ministry because ministry is about diligence. Most people desire increase. They admire what God is doing in the life of great ministries, but they do not have an understanding of the kind of labor that goes in to be trusted with men. Hallelujah. It's a sacrifice. You will never be an effective priest at your convenience. No. We were not trained that way. Those who trained us labored unto death. We saw from them diligence. And I speak with all due respect to those of my generation here. No, take away that geo office mentality and get to work. There are souls to save. If you don't have a sermon to preach, go and sit in your study room and be designing a Bible study manual to mentor your people. You can't say there is nothing to do. Honestly, anyone in ministry who only does Sunday to Sunday is a lazy person. Take that from me. There has to be someone to be following up during the week. You know how long it takes to prepare a sermon that is balanced and theologically sound. Not to scrabble something while they are taking offering. And then you come up and say, don't worry. We need to sit down. Don't teach people opinions. Get the word. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed. There is a relationship between shame and laziness. Hallelujah. Let's encourage our worshipers. Don't write songs that are meaningless. Songs that just came as a result of copying all kinds of things. No. The intelligence that is in your song is where the edification comes from. It's good to sing, but what is the song saying? Is it helping someone know God? Are we together? Let's minimize some of these songs that market ignorance. Praise the name of the Lord. Please someone who has faith, say after me in Jesus' name. I receive grace to feed God's people. I receive grace to feed God's people. You're a man of God, please go back home and sit down. I don't condemn you. There are concordances. There are lexicons to buy. Are we together? There are manuals. People have already labored for you. For God's sake. Let's sit down and get truth and feed God's people. It is at this point that with all due respect, I respect the Catholics and the Anglicans. The Pentecostals, thank God. I mean, we thank God for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But you see, I was raised by the Anglican and there was no room for laziness. The structure, if anyone here has passed through the Anglican communion, no, you don't stand and preach opinions. The topic is already known, so you won't come and preach nonsense. With sufficient verses, well researched. Yes, sir. You would not even serve if you could not recite the Apostles' Creed. You see that? Blessed be the name of the Lord. So we must obtain grace to build God's people. Your sermons should come out of your desire to see God's people built. But your sermons will be an overflow of your transformation. You cannot feed God's people beyond your level of spiritual transformation. Let me repeat that again. You cannot feed God's people beyond your level of spiritual transformation. And let me make an honest admission to you. There are certain things that your people need that you don't have the grace to give them. You must have the unashamedness to outsource the graces that can help them. Graces that are vetted across the lines of godliness and character. And don't let your people die because of ego. If you don't have the grace, there are people within the body. Is God helping us? I have to give us the last area and then we'll stop. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. My final thought with us as a contribution to this conference is I want to identify a few issues within the body of Christ that I believe as a recommendation that God is going to help us. Part of my call and my mandate is to help bring love, unity, and balance within the body. You never find me insulting people, tearing down people, tearing down another person's ministry. That is not, it has never worked. It won't work. Hallelujah. But the church of the Lord Jesus Christ from its inception has never been without challenges. Please, I want you to listen carefully. Having challenges across the body is not necessarily a proof of backsliding. In most cases, it's not even a demonic issue. It's just the reality that comes with the human nature. And if you understand leadership, you know that conflict and everything around it is part of growth. When the church began to grow, there were issues. Is, is that not so in your Bible? There were issues. You find that in Acts chapter 6. The first issue we see that the church had to deal with was welfare issue. Some people felt like they were being neglected in the daily sharing. And they, the report, it first started as a rumor. And then it got to the apostles. And the apostles said, no, we have a mandate and we have a jurisdiction to stay in. And this is a lesson for someone. The more growth comes the easier for you to move away from the ministry and get into administrative duties. And administrative duties are wonderful, but if you do not outsource systems that keep you focused, you will stop being a man of God and become an excellent administrator. There are people, the worst thing that happened to you is that you grew in ministry. That in itself seemed like an attack. Because you left the ministry of the word and prayer and got to serving tables. Tables should be served. But he said, no, select some among yourself. But we will give ourselves continually, Acts chapter 6 and verse 4, to prayer and the ministry of the word. And how many of you know that among those who were selected to serve tables, other people rose up from there, including the person that the Bible identifies as an evangelist. They were ordained to serve tables, but eventually at least two of them became mighty men. Philip was one of them. Stephen was another. Hallelujah. But let's talk about two things or three things as I wrap up. There are many challenges in the body of Christ. And there's almost no end if we have to dissect them one by one. Because most of those challenges are subjective. But I will talk about the issues that concern everybody. Number one, and uh, the PFN chairman Lagos chapter graciously mentioned one of them. I think that as the body of Christ, we must be able to come up with a statement of faith. At what point are you called a Christian? What are the parameters that define a Nigerian Christian? If we do not answer this question with all due respect, in the next 5-10 years, they will ship in a lot of things into this nation that will pollute the authenticity of the faith life. Once there is no de definition, anything is permissible. There must be a statement of faith. What do I have to believe to be a Christian? I feel very sad and um, I think um, the PFN uh, you know chairman also mentioned this about Dr. Otterbill you know bringing that as an observation because the faith work is largely personal and because of the person of the Holy Spirit and the unique expression of the way he trains us we will have different templates as far as our work with God is concerned and that is all right. But the danger there is that if it is not balanced by the jurisdiction of the word, we can delve into anything in the name of the spirit leads. So, I can walk down right now and slap Pastor Godman and say it was an instruction the Holy Ghost gave me. 
Are we together? I'm not being sarcastic. Now, it is difficult to say I'm wrong. Because one, you are not the Holy Ghost. Two, you are not me. And it's a spiritual thing. But later, after five years, I will find out it was a demon that spoke to me. And quietly repent. But while I'm doing that, I have mentored others across that error. So that slapping will now become a doctrine. Are we learning now? One of the ways error spreads is because it is spiritualized. Once error is spiritualized, it is difficult to tame it. Because the basis for taming it will look like being, you are being, uh, what's the word now? Are we together now? No matter your work with God, the template on how the Spirit of God works with people will always be consistent with the character of Scripture. We are not the first to receive all kinds of instructions. And I tell you, God can give sometimes very challenging instructions. Are we together now? As a man of God, they are, God has given me instructions that cannot be a doctrine. Now, there are three layers of learning spiritually. Number one is called a historic learning, historic archaeological learning. The second kind of learning is called a doctrinal learning. The third kind is called personalized dealings where because of your work with God and the unique expression of God's grace, he will lead you through a pathway that is only for you. You are never supposed to replicate that unique dealing. If not, it will destroy another believer. I'll give you an instance. God may check my heart and see to it that if he gives me many houses and many cars, because of my level of alignment and submission, it may lead me into perdition. And because of that, in order to manage that tendency of the flesh in me, he will give me a unique instruction. Never have more than three houses, never have more than three cars. And once I walk in keeping with that instruction, I will flourish in ministry. So when you do an interview for me and say, what is the secret of your success? I will tell you, I do not have more than three cars and three houses. If you now mentor that personalized dealing, Maybe your assignment requires 10 houses. You are in trouble already. Are we together? Now, because our personalized dealings with God produce results in our lives, chances are excellent that as we mentor those who are around us, we also bring our unique dealings and turn it into a doctrine because of the result that it produces. This is one of the causes of error in the body. So God can tell someone, slap the person on the wheelchair three times a divine instruction one two three and the person jumps up the young man who watched you now will organize a crusade and bring a son of a police officer who is on a wheelchair and slap him three times the guy will not get up and the boy will go to jail and we blame the holy ghost it is not the Holy Spirit. It is that we do not know the difference between God's unique dealing to you and what is doctrinal. Hallelujah. Never build ministry out of personal visionary experiences. No matter how spectacular, you will be destroying the ministry. We're wrapping up. Are we together now? I've had by the mercies of God. I am one who has been graced to live in the reality of angelic encounters. Encounters of the Holy Spirit. There are encounters that if I bring as my personal experience, it would destroy many people in the body of Christ. Not because it is erroneous, but the nature, the instructions, the things that God gave. The, the, the kinds of instructions that came from that encounter. It was for my personal edification. And it was not because it worked for me does not mean I automatically turn it into a doctrine. And sometimes the error comes sincerely. It's just people telling you their story, how it worked for them. Not every story is a testimony. There are some you keep to yourself. We have to pray. Your grace, your grace. I'm nothing without you Your grace, 
your grace shines on me. It's your grace, your grace. I'm nothing without you. Grace, your grace. Hallelujah. I may not have the time to discuss it, but please write it down. Number one, you need a statement of faith that guides your life. How far is far in your walk with God? How far is far as far as the church you are leading is concerned? All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. By the message of God, I have the privilege of preaching across several places, several denominations, and as a principle, I learn to adapt to whatever is the modus operandi of any church that I find. But I have my personal convictions. I don't preach everywhere because I agree with everything there. I have my reservations. However, it is not enough reason for differences. But as far as mentoring and building those under your care concern, you have to define what being a spiritual person is. Define the parameters for true spirituality. Number two, the second challenge that I wish I had the time to talk about was the fact that many people are in ministry who have been wounded and did not stay to be healed and they got into ministry. As simple as this sounds, it is dangerous to carry the mantle of priesthood when you are not healed. A scar is proof that a wound was once there but is now healed. And if that scar is not, if that wound is not healed, God does not send you. Most of the envy, the jealousy, the backbiting, and lots of things that you see happening across the body of Christ, the root of it is that people have pains that came from their background that they did not stay with the spirit to be healed from. Then they spiritualize that pain. Are we together now? Growing up in life and ministry, I really did not know that emotional wounds were real. I just focused on physical wounds. But now as God has helped me to grow, I have seen that emotional wounds can be like diabetes. It can stay there for years. There are people carrying all kinds of pain. Their anger is what sent them to go and pray and fast. The, the search for the anointing was not to bless people. It was from a standpoint of competition. Let me tell you this. Only wounded people wound others. When you are healed, you don't wound others. When you rejoice over the pain of another man, another person's ministry, when you are happy, when you see people going down, no matter how you spiritualize it, it is because there is an injury psychologists are wise enough and most of us have churches full of intelligent people they can look at you as a pastor and know that this sermon is not the holy spirit this sermon came from your background it came from your pain you are trying to manage your frustrations listen 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 I really I have to honor the time and stop and then all of you are here but I want you to please get this you need to go and stay with the Holy Spirit and say heal me oh God I don't know what injury Joseph your brothers threw you in the pit you are not even aware that you are wounded already make sure you are healed before you see them it took a healed Joseph to ignore the wickedness of his brothers it took a healed Joseph to not punish Potiphar. If I am Joseph, as I'm coming out as a prime minister, who is the first person you will call? Potiphar, where are you? You and the wife, get back into that prison. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Most of us came from polygamous families. You did not realize the effect. Most of us probably did not go to school early. Most of our parents made nasty comments and you did not know that it was wound upon wound. They called you a failure. They said you will never amount to anything. Just because you are old doesn't mean you are healed. 
you can be old in age still carrying the wound of childhood so you don't know why you are an angry man of God the moment someone says this your shoe is he original or fake that can become a two year war he was just throwing a joke but the jokes touched an injury listen carefully we are wrapping up but you need to hear this if we want to see unity there is a revelation that brings unity are we together healed there are preachers that are not healed that is the reason why there is fight for membership there are preachers that are not healed is the reason why we dishonor elderly people are we together now yes most of the things we do from a fake life to selling lies on the internet to trying to use dressing to show that faith is working all of those things are proof of a wound i'm telling you this when a young man gets into ministry and in one year his dream is just to buy a private jet have the largest church he may not be wrong but the young man has been wounded he does not even know what is motivating this it's not always demons demons are surprised themselves because what they did and what they did not do we're all blaming them We are going to pray. Oh. You've been patient. Listen. Most of you ask your congregations for extra time. Let me ask you for extra time now. We are going to pray. Listen to me. Please hear me. What do you think will become of a general overseer's wife? who was wounded by her stepmother called a bad lady a prostitute called whatever now she's married a man of God she's in a church most likely she will look at every other woman's dressing she's not a bad woman she's only a wounded woman who is this woman always dressing rich mark her for me all these useless wars in church I am telling you the cure is not just reconciliation the cure is healing Because I have a mindset that if I celebrate Pastor Godman and I celebrate the work he's doing, what if I lose my relevance? That orientation came as a result of a wound. Aircrafts don't crash in the air because there is space for every aircraft no matter how big it is. Some of you right here, you are in this place. I know we are pastors. Let God use me for one minute to heal someone before we wrap up. There are some of you who cannot see yourself. I, you are here now, but you cannot look eyeball to eyeball because you are angry. And most of those who have that anger don't have growth. So what they are fighting about is not it truly is unnecessary. You are looking for something to blame. And if there's nobody else to blame, your wife becomes a victim. Listen to me. Men of God, we have lost valuable people in our churches because we've not been able to tame our anger, tame our jealousy. Some of you are jealous even with your children and your sons and daughters. People you raise, you still fight them. It's not because you want them to fail. It's because you want to succeed alone. And that succeeding alone came because you did not take first position. You watch awards given to people and there is still the craving of a primary school child crying within an individual, still wanting to be celebrated alone. Let me teach you something. Let's, let's do a little consultancy. This is not a man of God now. The highest psychological need of any man, including you looking at me, is the need to feel loved, the need to feel valued, and the need to feel appreciated. Say after me, loved. Say valued say appreciated one more time say loved valued appreciated anybody including your spouse who violates that law becomes your enemy i'll tell you where your wars are coming from because someone bruised your ego knowingly or unknowingly you stepped into a meeting and the person trivialized your apostleship and you 
walked out of that meeting marking his face and he became your enemy forever tonight be healed be healed you have been wounding your congregations you tell them you are shouting at them because they went left they moved right you still shouted it's not the direction it's you PFN, I'm sorry, oh, you invited me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Now, please, everybody stand. Everybody stand. I'm going to give you the next five minutes. I'd like you to walk to everybody you can find and just tell them, I bless you and I honor you. Go ahead. God bless you. Hold the person, whether you know the person or not. I bless you and I honor you. We fought during the crusade, but we are still Christians. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We are neighbors, but I've never entered your church to see what God is doing. Please appreciate someone. I honor you. You may have 30 members, but I appreciate you. You may have two members, but I appreciate you. Take a minute. You'll soon return to your seat. Make sure you celebrate them. I don't care how many members you have. I know you are still learning. We may not be at the same level of grace, but just for you to know that we are stronger together, stronger together, stronger together, stronger together. the one that we praise you are the one we adore you give the healing and grace that our hearts always please return back to your seats rejoicing we're out of time Return back to your seat. We're about to pray. Return back to your seat. I know you are a prophet. I respect you as a prophet. I know you are an apostle. I respect you as an apostle. I don't downplay your stay. Listen. Let me tell you this. When you derive joy in demeaning the relevance of another man of God, it does not make you great. Fathers, please, we're wrapping up. We're wrapping up. Let me have your attention, please. God wants to tell us something serious now. Listen, please. Fathers, you are greatly honored, but respect the sons. They have an advantage of time and can learn experience from you. Every father has shown us what he can become, but we do not yet know what the sons will become. Eli, you play the role in the life of Samuel. But don't demean that young boy. That is the prophet who will ordain Saul. That is the prophet who will ordain David. Sons, respect fathers. It doesn't matter what they preach. It doesn't matter how many times you travel to the spirit and come back. You are still a son. If a baby takes 10 tins of breast milk, the baby does not become an adult. The baby becomes a healthy baby. Hallelujah. Let me speak especially to younger people in ministry. Don't follow this blind and foolish campaign of pointing fingers against fathers. Can I tell you, the more I grow in ministry, the more I'm silent. When you see fathers quiet, find out why. Young people have sin without wisdom. When a father says hmm, and keeps quiet, keep quiet as a young man too, you'll be wiser. Are we together? Contemporaries, let's respect ourselves. Now, if you find somebody's ministry, people are not idiots. They know truth when they see it. And the moment you begin to find people, you make you show your insecurity, it comes on display. Because those who are helped by God 
walk ever conscious of his mercy over their lives so I will end my session by saying this Apostle John speaking by the Spirit he wrote to three groups of people I write to you fathers I write to you young men I write to you children no matter the category of age and experience in ministry there is something written to you a letter from God what God is telling the fathers is not what he's telling the young men no the fathers have wisdom and experience the young men have strength the children have malleability of heart you can make them become anything hold hands with someone we're about to wrap up Lord make us instruments hatred let your love increase Lord make us instruments of your peace walls of pride and prejudice shall cease when we are your instruments Please look at me man of God if your principles and practices are wrong I don't condemn you but change if you have been mentored when I say unity I don't mean embracing everything because there are things in the body of Christ that are absolute nonsense don't mistake in what I'm saying if it is not Jesus crucified if it is not Jesus glorified if it is not Jesus revealed so when we talk of coming together we are not saying don't carry Rachel leave the idols of your father's house there is a better covenant with God there are some of us it was poor mentorship that led you into all kinds of extra biblical practices while we do not condemn you there is room for repentance change now use this conference to change some of you were taught by wrong friends manipulative ways to raise money for church there are veterans with understanding who can help you on how to structure church finances with integrity. Find them. Go and sit down under their meetings and learn. There are some of us who have all kinds of character challenges. These are things you have been ignoring for a long time but is telling on you. Go back and work on yourself. At every level, growth is still possible. Are we together now? So when I say this, the Bible says to examine ourselves whether we are still in the faith. Honestly, there are people I love, but they cannot be my friends. I love them sincerely, but until I see the degree of your yieldedness to Christ and his purposes, I love you from afar and I wish you well. But it will be a risk to bring you into my space. Your, your emotional carelessness is not healthy for friendship with me. Your level of indiscipline with anything at all. Say anything you want to say. Do anything you want to do. Jump into people's house. Collect their cars. Collect whatever. In the name of prophetic instructions. I love you but change. Don't harass any member to collect money from them. They didn't send you. If you are bankrupt, go to the one who sent you and say, What was the strategy for my feeding? Are we together? I have to say this we cannot end a pastor's conference without pointing this the truth is that some of you have lost your honor it faded like a leaf because of character issues your issue was not revelation you lack character once you drop down from the pulpit you are almost as if you've never given your life to Christ there are young people that carelessness started from campus and there was no system to tame it some of us are learning all kinds of rubbish learning all kinds of rubbish it has to change anybody who is coming to your church plundering you or making you disturb wealthy people in your church or all kinds of character challenges I don't condemn you never will I we are products of God's mercy but for God's sake some of you may need to take a break for a few weeks and sit down with a seasoned man of God and say help me I have anger help me I have lust 
help me, I have what again? Jealousy, bitterness, envy, huh? unforgiveness oh, over my dead body. No, 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 no. Repent now. Repent. Repent. This is why we are holding hands. One prayer and I leave this place. Show me mercy, oh God. Don't pray for your congregation. Don't worry about your congregation. Pray for yourself. Obtain mercy. Walk upon my heart. Someone pray. Walk upon my heart. Give me longevity of impact in ministry. Let me be a person of love genuinely. 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 Let me become a builder to the body, not a destroyer. Someone go ahead and pray. Repent for the manipulations you may have caused to the members of your church. Ask God to show you mercy. The Lord is nigh them that call upon him. Make a cry before God. I'm ready to do ministry with integrity from today. Integrity from today. Given to prayer. Given to the study of the word. Given to laboring to build God's people. Go ahead and pray. Let it be from the depth of your heart.